Welcome to today's program, and I have the most extraordinary guest. It's Gracia Burnham, and many of you listeners uh, have prayed for Gracia. And uh, this is an amazing miracle that she's with us here at the NRB convention in uh, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Gracia, first of all, thank you for being on the program. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, you were pictured in just about every newspaper in the world at one time, and it was not a very pleasant time, I'm sure, mm. for you. But let's go back a little bit. Where are you from, and how did you find the Lord? Oh, uh, my dad's a pastor. I grew up in family devotions, hearing about the Lord, and at a very young age gave my life to Jesus. And where was this? Uh, Well, we moved a lot. Um, We were in Canada for a while. We were in Illinois for a while. We were in Kansas City for a while. We didn't stay put very long. Okay. And and, uh, what what led up to the... Was this because your dad preached all the time? One day you just felt you needed to give your life to Christ or what? Uh, Probably. um, I think... God draw me to himself early in life. Um, But then I went off to Bible college, and that's where I met Martin Burnham. He was an MK. He was a missionary kid from the Philippines. And um, I think God called me to Martin there. Could you describe a little bit of what type of person Martin was, why you were attracted to him? Um, He was very calm, cool, collected. He was a pilot. I knew he was an excellent pilot. Yeah. like most MKs, he wasn't worried about his public image. He was who <laughs> he was, and he wasn't going to try to be uh, look like Americans. And yeah. that intrigued me about him. He would wear a suit and cowboy boots. <laughs> so bless his heart. I just um, I think God called me to Martin and called Martin to the mission field, yeah. and I was thrilled. Yeah. Oh, that's great. But how did he propose to you? We went flying. And then he drove me to Arkansas, a state away. Uh And on the way to Arkansas, we stopped in a little town called Burnham, Missouri. Right? Burnham, Martin Burnham. And a little town, there was nothing there. And he asked me to marry him there. Did he get on his knees? Can you remember what he said? I don't think he got on his knees. (laughs) He, He asked me if I would be his wife and... I think the first thing out of my mouth was, are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I knew that God had called me to him. Now, you said he was an MK from Philippines. Was that with new tribes as well? Yes, his parents were tribal missionaries, and he grew up at a boarding school in Manila, Faith Academy. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, I know Faith Academy. Yeah, that's great. So uh, initially, how long were you married before you actually moved overseas? We weren't married very long. Right away, we went into missionary training. And with New Tribes Mission, there's quite a bit of training. Yeah, tell us Um, what the sort of training entails. um, We did a a year of what they used to call boot camp. They don't call it that anymore. Um, Just to get to know us. And so we would learn to live in Spartan conditions. And then for six weeks, we had to move out in the woods to jungle camp and just sort of live yeah. uh, with whatever we took out there with us. We built our own house and um, just getting us ready. And then, of course, Martin had specific pilot training. Yeah. He had to learn to fly into little short strips built up the yeah. side of a mountain because wow. that's what he was going to face overseas. Wow. So we had good extensive training. But as soon as we were done with that training, we left for the Philippines. And where, where were you based? Um New Tribes Mission Aviation was based in Arizona. Mm-hmm. New Tribes Mission headquarters is in Sanford, Florida. Okay. But when you went to the Philippines, where oh, did you go to? Uh, we first went to Aritau on the island of Luzon, the okay. big island. That's we not were exactly the safest place to go, is it? Though? Oh, we felt very safe, and we always avoided hot spots. Yeah. We were never careless. So tell us your living conditions. You, were you in like a little village or what? Mm, we were in a small town yeah. because our job was to keep the tribal missionaries who lived out in the jungle areas where no roads went, our job was to keep them supplied. Oh, I see. So we okay. had to have a good market. Yeah. We had to have a little grocery store. We had to have a hospital when they flew, mm-hmm. uh, did medical evacuations. Yeah. Um, we had to have a hardware store. So we always lived in a small town where yeah. we could get supplies. Oh, I see. And I was the radio operator, and I would <laughs> talk to the people in the tribal village, 
and take their grocery orders and oh. their medicine orders. And, and Martin um, would fly them in. And Martin would box them up and fly them in. That was our job. Wow. We were just the supplier. Yeah. And by then, did you have any kids? Our three children were born there yeah. in the Philippines. Um, once we got there, we started having children. We yeah. had three just right in a row. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So le- lead us through to this terrible situation. You, you decided to have a break, did you? And you were going to go have a little uh, sort of R&R. Uh, tell us where you went and, and how it all fell apart. Mm. Martin needed to go work on a small island in the southern Philippines called Palawan mm-hmm. uh, to fill in for a missionary pilot there. Um, Martin had just been on a trip overseas and had jet lag, so he needed to rest. So we went out to a little island resort called Dos Palmas so he could get some rest. And um, we were only going to be there 24 hours. Went to bed that first night, and the next morning there was pounding on the door. And Martin got up even before he got to the door. These three guys with M16s broke the door in. One of them took him out. One of them came over to the bed and lowered his weapon at me and yelled, Go, go, go. And I followed, and they were taking us down to a waiting speedboat at oh the dock. Yeah, the kids weren't with you, were the they? The children for... weren't with us. We yeah. had left them with coworkers. Okay. Wow. Uh, as we pulled away from the dock, these now, wh- guys... what was the date? Uh, May 27, 2001 was the date. So did you suddenly realize this is bad? Yes, when they raised their weapons in the air and yelled, Allah Akbar. Oh. That's when we knew it was the Abu Sayyaf that had us. Everyone in the Philippines knows who the Abu Sayyaf are. Can you are. explain who they are? They are um, militant Muslims who have declared jihad in that area of the world. Only their jihad has degenerated into a kidnap for ransom group. Oh. And yeah, we knew we were in big trouble. And how many people were taken altogether? There were 20 hostages taken that day. But you were the only missionaries. We were the only missionaries. There were three Americans, Martin and I, and a businessman from California. Okay. And it was pure. It wasn't a religious hijack. It wasn't a religious thing. It was just for money. Yes, they didn't target us at all. Yeah. Um, they were very disappointed to find that the Americans. Well, that we were Americans. Uh, Americans don't play the the ransom game very well. Yeah. And missionaries don't have any money. <laughs> they were hoping for European businessmen because oh, okay. they knew that they could get money from them. So you go in the speedboat. Where mm. are you taken then? They took us about three days out over the the ocean to a Muslim stronghold, a little island called Basilan, uh-huh. that they knew very well. They knew the trails. They knew the... Um, places, the villages that would give us food and supplies. And for the next year, we were running for our lives and sleeping on the jungle floor and drinking dirty river water and uh, starving and witnessing the atrocities that these guys committed against villages as we would go through. What were they doing then? Um, Well, to gain control, often when we went through a village, they would separate a few guys off to the side and chop their heads off. That's what... Did you you see that? I didn't see that. Uh, We heard that. We heard the the yells and the the scuffles. And um, these were not honorable men. They... um, They truly have, when people say Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines, it brings terror to the hearts of the Filipino. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So this this went on. Did you finally settle in one place or were you on the move? No, we never settled in one place. We were always moving because the Philippine military were coming in trying to rescue us. Yeah. But they didn't really know much about hostage rescue. Yeah. Uh, when they found us, they would just, you know, shoot up the camp Rambo yeah. style. Uh, and we would have dead and we would have wounded. And we sort of knew that one of these days those bullets were going to find us mm. and we weren't going to survive the gun battles. Wow. Did you know at the time how much publicity was going out on this? We had no idea. Of course, we knew um, New Tribe's mission and our families were praying for us. And the little ripple effect, we didn't know that all over the world people were starting to pray for us. Uh, Christian radio and broadcasting and 
um, people just kept our names out there, and all of a sudden these these people who nobody knew, the world knew to start praying for Martin and Gracia. What yeah. would we have done without the prayers of God's people? So how long did this go on for? We were held hostage a little over a year, a, oh. a year and 10 days. And you, you still live through it. I mean, you know, the, the, you must have got sick quite a bit. We got sick. We suffered from dysentery and diarrhea. Uh, we were dirty all the time. There were no clean clothes to change into. You know, we started feeling more like animals than human beings. Wow. And often we felt forsaken, yeah. forsaken, God forsaken and I used to tell Martin, everyone's forgotten us. I know it. This has gone on for so long. Everyone's forgotten us. Of course, we knew that wasn't true. Did you used to yell at God sometimes? Um, I had a few crises of faith. Yeah. Week 10 was very difficult for me. I think I'd given God about six weeks to get us out of there, <laughs> and he didn't come through. And uh, I think week 10, I really had it out with God. I decided he didn't love me because... Yeah. If he loved me, he would answer our prayer and we would be out of there, right? Sure, yeah. um, and here we were stuck in a bad situation. And Martin saw the depression and the horrible time I was having. He said, Gracia, it's so sad to see you giving up your faith. I said, oh, I'm not giving up my faith. I still believe Christ died for our sins. God made the world. I just don't think God loves me because he's not coming through for me. And Martin said, seems to me either you believe it all or you don't believe it at all. You need to choose what you're going to believe. And I decided to believe what God's word said to be true. I have loved you with an everlasting love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And I just grabbed onto those promises that I knew to be true and claimed them as my own, even though I wasn't feeling like yeah. God was for us and not against us. And I'm sure with all the illness as well, that didn't help with you. Oh. You know, you, that would be very depressing, I would think. It was awful. And, and a year of nev- not sleeping well. Yeah. You know, we could never get comfortable on the jungle floor. Uh, we always knew that the military was nearby. There was always a um, an uneasiness. Never once did we relax. And yeah. so the... The weariness wasn't just physical, it was mentally and morale-wise. We were so weary. And how did the other hostages handle it all? Uh, Well, we we did the best we could. The other hostages were truly heroic. Um, One by one, they were ransomed. Um, Their ransoms would come in and they would let them go. A few of them escaped. Um, The other American, I'm sad to say, about a week into our captivity, was beheaded. They got angry with him. Um, Till at the end, it was me and Martin and a Filipino nurse for the last, like, five months of our captivity. It was just us three. And we just um, tried to encourage each other as best we could. Could Um, could you ever talk with these guys, or were they just... They just didn't want to know. Well, we we didn't speak the languages that they spoke. One day I counted, and there were like six different languages being spoken amongst these guys. Um, We didn't speak any of them well. The ones we could communicate with were the ones that spoke some English. So really we didn't communicate real well with anyone except the leaders who knew some English. Wow. What was the very lowest point for you? Was that the time when you just felt you've, you've... God had forsaken you? Um, You know, I think the lowest was when we reached year one and we were still in there. Who would have ever thought that we would live for a year in the jungle? And the nightmare just kept continuing. And we would think, oh, this can't get any worse. And then it would. Um, That was the low point. But you know what? At the low point, one day we begged a radio from one of the guys. We were dialing around trying to find something English speaking to get um, news from home. And we found a Christian radio station out of Alaska and right tuned in right as a pastor was talking about how Christ sits at the right hand of God making intercession for us. He said, if you could hear Jesus in the next room praying for you right now, you would not be afraid of anything. And then he prayed for people in war-torn areas and people who were being oppressed because of their faith. And we looked at each other. This man's 
this man's talking to us. He's praying for us. Mm -hmm. And it was the first spiritual input that we'd had in a year. And God just sent us that at the lowest point of our captivity. I'm just so thankful to him for his goodness. Did you ever find out who it was? Yes, I've met the man. Oh. His name was Andy Baker, and he's from here in Nashville. Wow. And I've gotten to spend a little bit of time with him a yeah. few times. What was his reaction when he found out? I, I think he couldn't believe it. I made a statement at Martin's funeral yeah. on national TV, yeah. and I talked about KNLS out of Alaska and yeah. Andy Baker, and someone called him up who knew him, and uh, we were able not long after that to get together. So how long after you got the radio did did it all fall apart? Um, A few days later. Yeah. um, I I think the Abu Sayyaf had been told that a ransom was waiting in a village, and we couldn't find the village because it didn't exist. Yeah. And we were wandering around lost, and what we didn't know was... Um, A homing device had been sewn into a backpack that had come in. And so the the guys, the Philippine military, were able to tell where we were, and they were closing in on us. That last day, um, it clouded up to rain, and always before, we were always safe in the rain. It was like an unwritten rule. We never fought in the rain. But that day, we stopped to wait out the rain, and the military didn't stop. They came over the hill, and as usual, they just opened fire on us. And all three of us hostages were shot. Hmm. I was shot in the leg. Martin was shot in the chest. Edibora in the neck. And um, Martin just lay there during the gun battle, and all of a sudden, he got very heavy. Um, Have you heard that term the weight of death. Mm-hmm. I think that's what I felt. Wow. And um, then as the Abu Sayyaf retreated down the river and the soldiers came down over the hill, I began to move my hands around so they would know that I was alive. And they drug me to the top of the hill. And I looked back at Martin and he was white. That's new, when I knew he was dead. Mm. And in that moment, God gave me a peace that I cannot explain because this is not how I would have written the end of our story. It's not what we were praying for. But God just gave me a peace that this was his plan, that the same God that had kept us going for over a year in the jungle did not lose control that day. And and I still hang on to that. How how can you explain, you know, his death then? How do we explain his death? I I don't know. But I can tell you the end of the story. God Mm. in his goodness has shown me maybe why we went through that year. Um, Recently, I have been able to find 23 of the guys who held us hostage. They're in jail in Manila in a maximum security prison for the rest of their lives. And our foundation has begun working with them and doing projects for them to show them the love of Christ and having things printed into their dialects. Um, They're reading the scriptures in their own languages. Some of them are going to Bible studies. So far, three of them have come to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And I think God, out of his goodness, is just letting me see how maybe um, he used our captivity to do something in some lives of some men who otherwise would never have had Access or would never have heard the gospel. Mm. And I just can't help but believe that it's not over till it's over. Yeah. And have God's going to keep doing it. Have you actually met them at all? I haven't met them. I correspond with them. Yeah. I get letters. They asked me to come about a year ago, and I didn't have peace about visiting the jail, but Martin's parents, um, who were missionaries in the Philippines, went and visited the jail for two days in a row and talked with those men who held their son captive and had the best time. Um, So someday I'm going to meet those men. (laughs) Someday my children are going to walk into that prison and put their arms around these men and pray for them. Wow, that's amazing. What's the name of the prison? It's Montenlupa. I've been there. Have you been there? Huge place. Yes, it is a huge place. Wow. So coming back to the... You know, the actual moment when you were so supposedly rescued, but Martin was shot. Uh, initially, how were you just absolutely stunned? 
Was that a period where you were just really angry at God for what happened? Oh, no, no. I I had worked through the um, the issues I had with anger with God, with thinking he didn't love me, with wrestling with the sovereignty of God in my life. I had settled those issues in the jungle. Wow. For a year, I learned those lessons. And when Martin lay there dying, there was no questioning God. Mm-hmm. I knew that this was God's plan. I knew that... He was going to take care of me. I knew that he had answered our prayer. We were begging God to let one of us at least go home and Mm. raise our children. We did not want them to be orphans. And God did it. Mm. He let me raise the children. And, you know, the children love God. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of my boys is doing what his daddy did. He's flying in Botswana, Africa for a mission organization. Um, now you say you had you had a, a leg wound. How bad was that? Um, well, uh, not bad enough to kill me. <laughs> um, I have a huge scar. They airlifted me in a helicopter out to a sort of a U.S. Army field unit that they yeah. had set up, and they did the surgery right wow. there out in the field. Did they pull the bullet out then? Uh, parts of oh. the no. I have a lot of shrapnel still in my leg. Yeah. Um, they left a lot of it in, but they fixed me up well, and they just cared for me so well. And everyone's been so kind to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and this has just opened huge doors for me to speak, mm-hmm. um, to tell my story, to talk with victims of crime. Yeah. To um, It just gives me a little bit of credibility in some arenas that I never, would've ever had. would yeah. have had. Yeah. Um, so I take my opportunities. If somebody <laughs> wants an interview, I give it if I possibly can. Because who knows, who knows what path someone might be going down sure, today? Yeah. Paths that they never would have chosen if they were choosing. Um, hardships that they don't feel adequate to bear. Yeah. And you can encourage them that God is enough. Um, that God is leading and directing you. He's you just follow him and he'll make everything that happens to you work together for good mm. and for his glory and that's what we want um, were, were you able to say goodbye to martin i didn't say well i said goodbye to martin several times during our captivity okay. one day we were being uh shelled by artillery they were shooting from 10 miles away right. and artillery was landing all around us and i told martin you know what i need to say goodbye to you yeah. i i want to say everything i want to say yeah. now before it's too late so what did you say um i said i'm glad i married you <laughs> I, I i'm glad we had a good marriage yeah. i'm glad we came to the philippines yeah. i would never choose to not have done what we did um, thank you for being a good husband. I, I'm so glad God gave us the children yeah. he gave us. I was able to say all those things. So when Martin lay there dying, yeah. I could do what he had taught me to do yeah. in a gun battle. He told, taught me, lay flat on the ground and don't move until someone tells you what to do. Huh. Make the smallest target you can possibly make. I was trying to look dead. Yeah. I thought the worst thing that can happen now is they drag me off into the jungle and this nightmare continue. Yes, yeah. So I was able in that moment to keep my head on straight. I'd already said goodbye to Martin, but I didn't even know he was dying. You know, I, I'd never watched a person yeah. wow. die. Well, if people want to know more about the ministry, uh, what's the website? Um, www.graciaburnham.org. Finally, uh, in a, just a couple of words, how can people pray for you now? Oh, pray for wisdom for me. Um, but people often say, oh, Gracia, you're so strong and brave and and smart. And I'm none of those. And that's the good part of the story. Yeah. I am very weak. I'm a city girl. I don't even like to camp. But <laughs> God uses weak things, yeah. right? So when people see what happens, they know that God did it. Yeah. And just pray that I'll have wisdom. I'm this ditzy blonde just trying to <laughs> keep going. Just pray that I'll be wise yeah. and um, that that I'll be faithful. I want to finish my course well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank God bless you. Thank you very much. It's an honor. 